few seconds. Um, so how have you been? Oh, good. I've been very busy, but good. <laughs> uh, I And we are now live. Mm -hmm. So in between, in between, maybe um, Marianne uh, has posted uh, a Twitter link for Sotheby's and uh, you are all invited to nominate uh, the best uh, crypto artist and mention the reason why you think that Marianne should be nominated and the artwork that uh, Marianne would like to uh, put forward is uh, the bend the knees taking and the it, knee. taking the knee sorry and it is uh, sorry that's uh, too much uh, Game of Thrones and then <laughs> um, taking the knees and that's um, the uh, artwork that is on super rare so if uh, you would be so kind and, to yeah, then I, take... Um, or actually any of the pieces from, uh, the, from my super rare, but let me get you the link for taking the knee specifically. I think it, it was one of uh, my favorite as well, because okay. when I, I, I look at it, I was like, who's the artist? Is it a man, without looking at your name, right? Uh, is it a man or a woman? And then it's when I say, no, it can only be a woman who can do that because <laughs> no man would ever put, I mean, a mix of uh, people, but as well races and, and, and form and shapes that were voluptuous. And I said, no, that's a woman. And then I saw your name and I said, yes. <laughs> Yeah, I put the link for taking the knee as well. All right, yeah. so if you look at the, the chat box, uh, please have a look at uh, the taking the knees and then uh, the Twitter, uh, please uh, hashtag natively digital and uh, nominate Marianne uh, for this. Um, what do you, what do you do uh, to be um, in the show uh, on Sotheby's in June, you said? And that's my Twitter <clears throat> for the tag. Yes, and please don't forget to uh, tag Marianne. Um, now those are their instructions. Tag the artist, okay. collect the piece, use the hashtag natively <laughs> digital. Ooh, step one, step two, step three. <laughs> Record from the artist you like. And yeah, so those are the steps. <laughs> All right. It is 34, so um, shall we start slowly but surely? Let me start with my usual wonderful introduction. <laughs> so welcome everyone to this uh, Agora talk. I'm really super excited to have the, tonight uh, Marianne Mugadam and um, she will of course uh, show us uh, a work. Um, and uh, for this talk, we have as well the wonderful Elizabeth uh, as curator and moderator. I wish you uh, really um, a good time and have a good talk. And um, well, I hand over to you now, Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mimi, for the kind introduction. Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm so glad that you could join us today. I'm really excited to welcome Marjan Mokadam who will be sharing a presentation about her work. Marjan is an award-winning digital artist and animator who primarily works in computer graphics and digital 3D. She lives and works in Brooklyn, where she is a tenured full professor of CG animation and mixed reality at Long Island University. Marjan is well known for her original style of 3D CG figuration and animation that has been central to her practice since the 80s. Her work merges the ideals of sculpture and animation, resulting in a unique style of figuration that she defines as chronometric sculpture. Throughout her practice, Marjan explores digital embodiment for curated art exhibitions, 
and commissions, as well as interventions. Marjan's interventions include her influential art hacks. Art Hacks is an ongoing series that have been exhibited on Instagram since 2016 as a means of redefining form for digital art. Throughout Art Hacks, Marjan actively engages in a thought-provoking and critical discourse, seeking to democratize curation and exhibition spaces by visually hacking digital bodies into found footage of art fairs, galleries, and museums. Her Art Hacks include the recurring and now viral digital embodiment of Glitch Goddess who has amassed over 18 million views through both Marjan's social media and other top net art channels. Marjan has a prolific exhibition history that spans four decades. In 1996, she was the featured artist for the launch of the first ever commercial internet art gallery in New York, sponsored by Prodigy Inc. Since then, she has notably exhibited at the Smithsonian and has been an official selection of the SIGGRAPH Computer Animation Festival four times. Her achievements include being featured in the Forbes top AR apps, installations and activations list in 2019 for her art hacks. In 2019, Marjan was also an official AR Adobe artist in residence for Project Aero. More recently, she was featured in the 2021 BBC Click documentary, When Art Goes Digital. She has sold her crypto art to top NFT collections on Super Rare and her other works are held in private and institutional collections. Marjan has an impressive calendar of events for 2021, including a solo exhibition at the Museum of Contemporary Digital Art in June. Titled The Digital Embodiments and Interventions of Marjan Mokadam, the exhibition will span multiple decades of her digital art practice. This year, Marjan is also completing a public art commission for a digital sculpture trail at Hillsborough Castle Forest Park in Northern Ireland. The trail will include both a physical sculpture and a permanent AR piece by Marjan. Her art hack of Art Basel 2020, Taking the Knee, will be displayed in an upcoming exhibition at OO Landis Culture GmbH, which will trace the history of NFTs in art. This will be the world's first major museum exhibition exploring this subject and will take place both in the museum and online in crypto, in crypto voxels. Marjan's talk with Agora Digital Art today is entitled Embodiment and Interventions in Digital Art. This talk will focus on Marjan's digital embodiments, animations and interventions spanning her well-established career from the 80s until the present. Marjan will share with us how her practice offers contemporary insight into expanding, expanding art history in authentic and persistent ways I'm now going to hand over to you, Marjan, and we'll follow her presentation with a Q&A. Wow, what, a, what an introduction. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, for that uh, amazing introduction. And thank you so much, Mimi, for the introduction as well, and also for hosting these and for Agora and everything else. I, I really believe in your mission and everything Agora is about and, and, and support it very strongly. And I would like to thank everybody who's here today for this talk and all the people who will be catching it later on YouTube, et cetera. Um, so I'm, I'm actually, uh, as Elizabeth brought up, my art practice goes back to the 1980s. So uh, I'm gonna actually have a video that shows, you know, some selected works uh, throughout the years. Uh, let me just set up my desktop sharing. And uh, so um, I have a video with uh, selected works throughout the 1980s, from the 1980s till now, which shows the evolution of my embodiment work and also uh, the recent interventions. I always say my first exhibited uh, computer art piece was done on a Commodore 64, and here it is. I exhibited this in 1984, and then I moved to the Amiga, and, and I always say when men were uh, doing, more, when computer art was mostly men doing color cycled polygons, I was opening vaginas inside of heads. Then in the 1990s, I was working with computer generated fractals. This is a German TV CDF spot on me. And this was my uh, box, which was the head immersive early virtual reality installation in 1995. Uh, and I was cutting and chopping up and reanimating the fractals and that's an infinity cube inside and exhibiting it as various different head immersive installations like the one you see here. Um, I was also exhibiting them as projections and as de solid canvases like a painting with a projected uh, gold frame. Uh, that's actually me with the blonde hair back then. 
And that's an example. I, I would call these landscape chaoscape because it was the type of a landscape that consisted of computer generated fractals and what was termed as chaos theory back then. Um, I also did these pieces as prints. Um, I also uh, did uh, early online work on the mosaic internet. That's also me, by the way, <laughs> back then. Um, and I also did them, um, um, and, and I, see, I think you're actually gonna see a clip of my early mosaic era, uh, early internet. Well, this is before Netscape, uh, by the way, uh, website and work. And I would also do this work uh, I would project the same animations I would create on myself while contemplating chaos. I did this performance piece in a bunch of different uh, galleries in the 1990s in Soho. These are some stills from those performances. And then I made a 3D avatar of myself in, uh, at the same time and projected the animations onto it. This is actually the dot-com gallery site on the old web today. You can actually see this. It's archived. And I was the featured artist. And this is the the 3D hyper real version I created, as you can see, it's the same 3D avatar with the animations. And this was actually an entire website with you know, many pages. And I also had it mirrored on my side. And then of course, more bald humanoids with procedural and fractal dermal pigmentation, as I called it, which brought about the adoration theories, which were post-humanist works that paired the bald humanoids with technological extensions of the body. Um, this was actually the last piece from that collection that I did, which was in SIGGRAPH uh, 2003 and the CGO 330 Years of Computer Art International Traveling Exhibition that toured galleries and museums from 2003 to 2005. And then starting um, in 2008, I started to work with uh, motion capture and it was early mocap technology and I was working with improvised dance. This is Gab which was in SIGGRAPH 2009 and DVD review best of that year. And uh, this was like a pretty groundbreaking work at that time. I was creating these abstract and pretty CG figures made up of um, you know, modulated parts that were reflecting on interoception, breath cycles, heartbeats, uh, energy cycles. And SCAB was about post-traumatic stress syndrome. So it, it was really exploring digital embodiment and how do I show these psychological states and these various other states of being. Um, and uh, this basically birthed the pipeline uh, that I then used for the next four to five years in creating my Aug Revolutions collection, which consisted of you know, large format prints, animated paintings, sculpture VR, and also uh, avatar painting in which the audience wrote the figures uh, with gestural control of uh, uh, explosions. The, 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 this collection explored, you know, my experiences of living through the 1978-79 Islamic revolution in Iran on the one hand, and then the whole idea of revolutions politically and also artistically and mimetically. And there was within this body of work also uh, some feminist pieces uh, as well. Um, that's uh, shooting uh, Venus. and uh, Venus and Adonis. And Swarin based, loosely based on contemporary German philosopher, Peter Sloterdijk's uh, Swarin trilogy. And uh, yes, if you look up at the VR, there I am. Then in 2016, I had been doing these sort of uh, mixed reality projects on Instagram. And I decided to do the art hacks by hacking the same uh, digital embodiment dialogue and my critical discourse into found and shot exhibition footage and um, and and also working with what was happening at that time but that was in the 2016 art basel and when the jeffman's puppy smashed and it was like a metaphor for the shattering of america with the 2016 uh, donald trump election and that was the color cycle pussy fights back at art basel this was my non-binary nude glitch at uh, Gagosian the landmark survey of uh, 100 years uh, of art. Um, and, and for me, it was about, uh, you know, uh, intervening in that show because there was no digital nude and there was also no non-binary. Um, this is my glitched Odalis, uh, which is uh, at the Whitney, which was, you know, the traditional Eastern harem girl. And some of the hacks were also critiquing the over uh, financialization and commodification of art, contemporary art through the art fair system. This was my best at Mary Boone and Glasses and Waxish, which then went viral with millions of views on the Nowness post. Nowness now has this as part of its Pioneers of Media Art collection, uh, cultural programming collection. Um, this was my hack with Sarah Lucas, who's an artist I admire and respect. And I very much sort of uh, felt that 
uh, my approach to embodiment uh, was something I wanted to engage her work in uh, as a dialogue. Of course, political events such as the Kavanaugh hearings were happening during freeze, and of course, they made it into my art hack. This was kind of like an early glitch goddess, and this is the viral glitch goddess uh, uh, hack. And glitch goddess um, intervenes on the art historic idea that a woman is a singular form by using digital plasticity to go from you know slender, heavy, pregnant, young, old, glitched, um, and uh, abstract and stylized. Um, this was Freeze uh, 2019, New York, Freeze 2019. And at some point, Glitch Goddess, I started to hack her into the fashion runway. This was the Versace show with J-Lo. And American Purple was born during the uh, 2020 election cycle. Um, and it was really uh, about what was happening in the country at that time. And there were other chronometric sculpture pieces that I would do outside of these interventions at that time too. There's a whole bunch of them. And these were like two of the, two of the ones that I picked. Uh, she's glitching the, this is glitch that I used in the turquoise niches. And she, of course, glitches the uh, architectural uh, niche behind her. This is another variation of it. Uh, these are all accompanied by uh, music and sound, of course, which I have uh, silent right now so I can talk on top of it. I had originally done AR for uh, the Old Museum Digital Sculpture Show in 2017. So in, in 20. 19, I was commissioned, 2018, sorry, I was commissioned to do autonomous for the Smithsonian Museum and the second version, which was foreign in the National Cathedral. Auto autonomous was the individual's pursuit of life, liberty, and happiness, and foreign was our collective pursuit of the same. I then did a whole bunch of exhibitions with print trigger at AR. This, this glitch goddess print trigger, the audio has a, is a voiceover of women talking about their bodies and inequality based on all the comments that were made. Uh, on the viral post. So th there is this sort of like net aggregated quality and there were sculptured pieces as well with AR. And um, you're seeing some of the exhibited works. That's actually, a, uh, was from Autonomous. And then I did the artist in residency with Arrow and then my work was picked for a, a top 2019 AR activations. This was last fall, the exhibition I did at Art of Our Century Gallery in New York with print triggered AR and video art objects. And this was, of course, my hack of the Mark Link head. Mark and I are friends, and I've often joked, you should let me mess with your hands and these heads. And he's like, anytime. So this resulted in me creating Tomoma, the other Moma, which has all of my work on the walls and Mark Link's head, which I reanimated. Which brings us to crypto art. Last summer, I entered the crypto art world with an adaptation of my Taking the Knee Art Basel 2020 uh, hack, or Taking the Knee in Solidarity with GAN generated painting. And I basically redid that hack with all GAN generated uh, components in the background instead of the art that was uh, on the Art Basel slide. This is my Lourdes. Um, and uh, she's actually part of the suite. So this was the first one. I redid my Bessé also with a, a 3D Mary Boone gallery and GAN collage paintings that I did. Uh, those aren't actually Stephanie Hines. Those are my gang collage paintings in the background. And then there was Crypto Art Rides the Bull outside the New York Stock Exchange last February. Um, these works have all sold. Uh, several of them have already sold into the uh, secondary market as well. And this is my Lord S with a uh, red and teal voxelite uh, GAN generated painting. And uh, some of this work was exhibited. Of course, Crypto Art was exhibited in F, F Wall Street uh, exhibition at Stella Bell's Museum and Crypto Voxels. And I did a voxel sculpture building as well in addition to the animation on top. Uh, that was the opening. <laughs> and I also exhibited that in uh, Graffiti Queens, the largest NFT art exhibition in Decentraland, uh, which was last March. And it was also recently exhibited at the 4156 collection in crypto voxels and I did the clubhouse talk for that as well. And that's my best nine of 2020 with three crypto art pieces, three art hacks and three exhibited pieces. And that's it in terms of highlights from uh, several decades of work. <laughs> well, thank you so much for sharing that insight into your amazing career and practice. And we're now going to start the Q&A. Um, so if you have any questions for Marjan, I'd like to encourage you to share them in the chat. Um, and I will ask them after our conversation or feel free to ask her yourself following our Q&A. 
Um, so I'd like to start this conversation by asking, how did what you now define as chronometric sculpture begin and evolve? And what do the possibilities of the style of figuration mean to you, both creatively and art historically? Well, I think that uh, you know any conversation about my chronometric sculpture has to begin with the with 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 the work that informs my practice. I, I'm very much informed by art history on the one hand, but I'm also informed by cinema history and animation history, computer art history, media history, and of course CG and CG history. So all of these ideas are informing my art practice, not just art history. And um, something that has always impressed me, like when I look at my favorite works of art, um, I think that there are works that as embodiment that very much conveyed ideas of the profound and the sublime on the one hand. And then there were other works in terms of embodiment that conveyed psychological states or the unconscious uh, or an aspect of what I call interiority or for that matter, interoception. And then there were works, especially in terms of 20th century modernism and postmodernism that conveyed states of being. And to me, like the, the, those states of being were such complex ideas. And, and for me, being always is, 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 is the place I go to more so than identity because being encompasses so many different ideas. And there's also an aspect of the non-physical and metaphysical, uh, metaphysical to it as well. So these were, these were my greatest inspirations. And this is what I was trying to do uh, with digital embodiment. And you know, when, when you know, people joke about crypto art as you know, bald humanoids with you know, wild textures and simulations, well, I've been doing that since the 90s. So like, where does that work? How do you evolve it? And so uh, one of the things that I did by showing the history was to show that evolution. It was always very important for me to do work that had never been, always had a drive to do that. Um, on the one hand, and it wasn't enough for me to just innovate technology. I had to innovate aesthetics. I had to innovate conceptually and philosophically and also redefine form. And so with all of these my ideas, as my work evolved, I mean, literally with SCAB, you can see that I'm really starting to play with what the body looks like as it's moving. And then, uh, you know, and then at some point it just became push the body uh, as far as I can, why, while conveying all of these different ideas. And if you look at, for instance, um, my non-binary nude glitch, she's all about translocation within the same body, within the periphery of the body. So her body steps outside of the footprint and it's like a dialogue of translocation within the body. Whereas with glitch to Adelis, she's almost like the exact opposite. She retains her footprint throughout. But then it's her body that forms both clothing and nudity. I don't know if you notice or not, but there are times when her body becomes shards of fabric and cloth covering her, and then they disappear and she becomes nude and her sexual body parts are then translocating within the actual form itself. And she was the harem girl responding back you know, over a century later in the 21st century through digital plasticity and in a way decolonizing the museum. Um, and then with Glitch Goddess, she was an art historic intervention in terms of the idea that a woman is a singular form. So her body is constantly resisting the singular form. When I did the Of Revolutions collection, many of those aggregated figures, which were made up of platonic scholars, were showing our transference from the physical to the digital. And in fact, in fact that entire collection is when you know, smartphones became ubiquitous globally. And, and so the idea was that we were becoming these packets of quantified machine parts that aggregated together became our digital identities. And that's why those figures were like that. And they were modulated too, in terms of showing some type of an interoception as if there was some kind of an internal organ or mechanism that was driving the modulation like breath or heartbeat. Um, but then with the plasticity, what happened is I felt that we're, we're fully digital now. But the question is, what are we as beings in the digital? And that's why the forms are so expansive, because all of us are so many different things simultaneously. It's almost like the way we are in the digital refuses any static state. It's a constant experience of being in flux. And so for my chronometric sculpture, I use a combination of, of course, 3D CG modeling and animation. 
I used a lot of procedural animation. I used mocap, I used post to pose animation, and I've kind of built like a custom pipeline and toolkit to uh, be able to do the stuff. And, and as you've um, you shared during your presentation, your art hacks are frequently created and shared to Instagram while art fairs and gallery shows are live. How do you select which events and venues to hack? And within that limited time frame, where do you first turn to seek inspiration and how do you transform that into a concept? Um, I think with the art hacks, my, uh, with the art fairs, my intention was to do the major art fairs. So for the last, since 2016, I've done the, all the major art, art fairs. And the ideas, I literally have three days. And, the, and, and what I do is determine but what kind of footage I can find online or shoot. Um, also, what is happening at the same time? I mean, there are events that happen uh, during these art fairs that clearly influence, uh, you know, the, what I call the aggregated human imagination on the internet, mimetically, and they sort of work their way in. So for me, it's very improvisational. I never know what to do. Um, and I literally work around the clock for three days until they're done and I post them. So I'd say it's a creative stream of consciousness collaboration with the mixed media content and my art practice and, and, and whatever comes out will be what the hack is. And on that same topic, what prompted you to exhibit your interventions on Instagram? What is, what is it about Instagram as a space that lends itself well to your art hacks and their aims? Well, I, I think sometime around 2015, I made a joke that you know, I do these like big exhibitions and art centers and this and that, and it takes so much work. And in the end, the only thing that matters is the documentation of social media. And it was, it was a joke, but it was also true. There was a part of me saying, they said, why not just do the work on social media to begin with, you know, instead of having to go through the entire physical exhibition process just to produce the exhibition documentation. So that joke contained within, I think, a lot of essential ideas in terms of everything that's changed. And I live in New York City, but even in 2015, the majority of the art that I was looking at was not physically in person in galleries and museums, even though I'm within walking distance of lots of galleries. But the majority of the work that I was looking at was on Instagram. And Instagram had very much created a new cultural uh, experience uh, for viewing art that did not involve physical attendance of galleries. And it was very different than Tumblr, in my opinion. It was very different than previous iterations of social media. Um, and, 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 and I think that what, what really blew me away in terms of the comments and DMs that I get from everyone is that there was, I discovered there's a very sophisticated art viewing audience um, on, on Instagram, especially in, in, in those years, I'd say between 2016 to probably 2018. Those were the peak years. Uh, where there was this incredibly sophisticated audience that was very interested in art. And um, there was this explosion of uh, creativity that was happening on Instagram. And I wanted to, to also ask, how do you see crypto art and NFTs impacting digital art? Well, this is, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting because I feel as if I've lived through the whole good bit of the history of digital art. And and, and, and at no point has digital art received uh, the acceptance or its uh, inclusion within the contemporary art world that other media like video art and performance art have enjoyed in the last four decades. Um, on some levels, digital art has always been on the periphery, never taken seriously, and very much underrepresented in terms of the contemporary art system. And um, so for me, when I see people at Sotheby's, I don't complain about work. I go, my God, this is a miracle <laughs> that this is even happening. So crypto art is finally allowing artists working with digital tools and creating digital art that is part of applied arts, yes, but there's an awful lot of fine arts digital work as well in the crypto art world and everything else in between. For the first time, digital artists are able to have their work evaluated, sold, collected, and resold. This exactly the same as you know, painters, sculptors, et cetera. And oftentimes enough, you know, when it, I've done a lot of materialization and fabrication of digital art over the course of the years, because that's the only way you could exhibit and sell them. But for me, the native form has always been the digital file. I mean, to, for me, an animation is not the video monitor in a gallery, it's the animation file. 
So I'm particularly excited about it because it's like this is the native form for what I've been doing, you know, what I've been doing for most of my life. And and crypto art, and, and when you consider how much digital art has been part of the greater cultural dialogue now for decades without any proper representation or evaluation within the contemporary art market, you realize that crypto art is finally allowing digital art uh, to be accepted as a valid and legitimate medium for the fine arts and to receive the, pro, uh, the, the, pre, the presentation and inclusion that it deserves within the greater uh, trajectory of art history. And you've titled your, your most recent art hack, Crypto Reinvents Art Outside. And I was wondering, what does reinventing art outside mean to you? And what has recently inspired you to hack outdoor spaces as well? Um, well, I, I always kind of like layer, multiple layers of meaning. I think for me, there was an aspect of outside that was COVID, you know, the amount of time that everybody's spending outside. But um, there's also an aspect of outside that's a metaphor for outsider art or outside the system or outside the, uh, you know, the, the orthodoxies of traditional contemporary art. So yes, it's about reinventing art outside of the art system. And when you think about it, when you look at art history, you realize that many of the innovations and disruptions of art history uh, either happen outside the existing conventional art world or on the periphery of it. So the art world has never historically speaking been an innovator. Um, you know, usually there's an innovation on the periphery or outside that then becomes something and then the art world adopts it. I literally lived through this in the 1980s, you know, where I, you know, in the East Village where Patty Astor had, you know, her uh, fun gallery with your know, fat wife, Freddie, who's a graffiti artist. And then, you know, Keith Haring and David Witt and all the new expressionist uh, uh, artists at that time. And a couple of blocks west, what Castelli was showing on West Broadway was a completely different thing. And nobody thought what, what Patty Astor was showing at fun gallery was art. Everybody thought, oh, it's just a bunch of young people doing crazy stuff. But you know, you look at last this week. I mean, or was it last week that Jean-Michel Basquiat's uh, skull from that era sold for uh, ninety-six million dollars? I seriously doubt if there's any artist Castelli was showing in the 1980s on West Broadway that's going to fetch that amount of money today. So you have to understand that these outside disruptions that happen ultimately end up having a greater influence uh, sometimes than the conventional orthodoxies that dominate the art market. So for me, yes. It's art is reinventing itself outside of the traditional art market and system. And I think it's very important that, uh, you know, sh uh, the, the crypto art writer is a female <laughs> with a changing body in my style. She's also rainbow colored. Um, one of the things that I love about the crypto art is so many of the artists that I meet are women. They're from Brazil. They're from Singapore. They're from Africa. And I absolutely love that. You know, I have a young Brazilian crypto artist friend who's, you know, he's, who's, he's, who's able to move himself and his entire family to, as he put it, the better part of town. I mean, this is really huge when you think about it. These are artists that would not normally have any access to the art market. And the fact that they're selling their work to collectors to an intellectual, inter, inter, international uh, collection market is really a miracle when you think about it. So yes, it's a woman, she's glitching the Wall Street Bowl and she's a uh, rainbow of colors and it's reinventing art outside of the conventional systems. And you're currently in the final stages of putting together your solo exhibition at Mokta. So my final question is, could you share a little bit about this experience? Well, this is a really exciting exhibition. Filippo uh, uh, Lorenzen is curating it and he's uh, done exhaustive research on my art practice. And, and, you know, we've been back and forth. He's selected a lot of pieces, some of the pieces that I showed um, and also other pieces I didn't show today. Um, and so I'm very excited about it. There's going to be three different rooms within the Mokta Museum in Decentraland. Uh, one room is going to be embodiments and that includes work from the 1980s to the approximately 2015 some of which you saw today. There's going to be a middle installation room with a 3D CG uh, VR installation. And then uh, there's going to be a room for the interventions and crypto art. And um, what, what is uh, fascinating of course is, is to, you know, kind of like find ways of getting as much as I can out of the center land. 
um, you know, exhibiting in these metaverses, I don't know how many people realize it's not always easy because of bandwidth issues, file size issues, et cetera. And so anytime you have lots and lots of videos to show, it's, it's like a huge challenge. Um, so, you know, this is something that we're working very closely with the developers at, in Decentraland, uh, just so that, um, you know, we can, we can pull this off because it's, it's going to be quite a technological challenge. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, as soon as this is over, I have to go back to working on the installation room. And uh, so I'm very excited about the show and I hope everybody can join us there. Um, you can set up a, an account for free on Decentraland, but just be aware that you might need a Ethereum wallet. Well, thank you so much um, for that really interesting Q&A. And I'd now really like to welcome questions from the audience as well. So please either ask your questions in the chat or feel free to join our conversation as well. Um, so I can see there are some questions in the chat that I'll read aloud. Um, so the first question is, crypto art aspires to collapse the foundation of the establishments such as galleries and museums. Do you think NFT art also blends the hierarchy between established and emerging artists? Yes, it absolutely does. I mean, you know, when you sort of, uh, you know, when you sort of look at, like I said, I mean, I'm, I'm talking to artists who are 22 years old from Singapore and they dropped out of college. <laughs> They've never exhibited their work. They've never worked as a CG artist. They're complete unprofessionals and they're entering the space and they're selling their art. And, you know, something I didn't get to mention, um, you know, during uh, an overview of uh, uh, my art practice was that in addition to creating and exhibiting all of these fine arts work over the course of the decades, I, I've been a, I was a production artist starting in the 1980s, working at different studios, uh, doing, you know, commercial animation and commercial CG. And at one point in the, in the 90s, I had my own studio with two partners, Digital Media Arts Inc. on Fifth Avenue and 18th Street. And, you know, I worked on top accounts from NBC Primetime Animation to, you know, multimedia presentations for Ernst & Young and other Fortune 500 companies back then. So, um, you know, like I'm someone who's had this very long career as a professional artist working on, you know, quote unquote, the hot shit accounts of the time and also doing exhibitions. And I'm like hanging out with someone who's 22 years old from Singapore who dropped out of college. And it's, you know, it's like, can't believe somebody actually just bought their art. So I love that aspect of uh, crypto art that it allows a mixing of the high and low. And if you think about the, the real innovation of the digital and the internet has been precisely this, this co-mingling of the high and low, this, uh, this dissolution of the hierarchies, mimetically speaking first, and now we're seeing the, uh, the repercussions of that economically, sociopolitically, and culturally as well. So absolutely, that's an important aspect of crypto art. But something that I wanted to also clarify is that, you know, to me, there's the term NFTs, which is really the technology. And increasingly people, uh, especially to uh, non-crypto artists entering the space now, I'm noticing, are preferring the term NFT art because they, they think that crypto has this derogatory meaning. But I actually like crypto art because the difference is this, NFTs are a technology, but crypto art is a movement and there's a difference in these. And the idea that crypto is derogatory, well, it's the intermingling of the high and the low aspect that, uh, that is embodied, if you may, in, in that umbrella term crypto art. So um, I still use the term crypto art because of the disruption that it is and not so much as uh, NFTs, which can be anything from, you know, top shot, NBA top shots to, uh, uh, I just saw Kate Moss had a video of her sleeping with revealing a nibble, nipple that just sold and for, I don't know how much. So you have celebrity, uh, you have celebrity content selling now as NFTs. Um, and so crypto art is, is a very different thing to me than just the umbrella term NFTs. And there's another question here for you. Um, what impact did living through the Iranian revolution have on your work? And what should your adoring viewers like me take away from this subject matter incorporated into your work? Well, you know, I, like I said, I've done a lot of work with that and, and a lot of the embedded writing in those pieces uh, really discusses a lot of my experiences. But I always say that, you know, I arrived in New York in 1979 
um, you know, pretty traumatized. And uh, and for me, um, I, I mean, I, I went to New York Tech where I was a student and, and you know, worked on back supercomputers to do computer graphics. Then two things happened. The, the, the first thing was I, I loved the possibility of futurism inherent in computer technology and making art with that technology. And maybe for me, it was the reaction against the regressive forces that had taken over my country of origin and pretty much ended my life uh, as I knew it back then. I'm getting emotional now because my mother just passed away. So it's, uh, it's been a difficult time. And, uh, and I find myself as, you know, being very vulnerable with all the losses of my life. But, um, and that's okay that it happens. And I'm sort of very accepting of it. But um, so sometimes I think if the revolution had happened, I may not have chosen to work with computer technology because, you know, I sort of pushed into the future because I was trying to get away from the past. And another interesting th thing that happened was that suddenly I realized that um, I was very good at it. And most of my friends who were other artists were like, oh, I can't handle computers. Oh, they were like terrified of computers. And I was like, but this is easy. And I was very good at it. And I think like most young people, you know, it's like the second you discover you're good at something, you know, you're like, oh, I want to do this more. So it was a combination, but the revolution has been, uh, has affected my work throughout. And maybe Andre's question, the best way I can answer it is that sometimes I think that when you've experienced a lot of catastrophic loss, and I'm the last member of my family alive today, so all my siblings have passed away, both my parents have passed away, and um, you know, many things that I've loved have passed away, and I carry a tremendous amount of loss and grief, is I think when you live this way, you, you sort of develop an appreciation for the profound, and you develop an appreciation for the sublime. You, you develop an appreciation for meaning and understanding and depth. Um, and I think that the reason I'm drawn to that is it's because it's the thing that allows everything to make sense. And sometimes I think Viktor Frankl was right. Understanding is more important than happiness. I feel wholeness in the depth of the, in the depths of the profound and the sublime and looking for these layers of meaning. And a lot of times, uh, many critics are now describing the problem of technology with culture is that, that it flattens culture. It creates a superficial layer and eliminates all the depth underneath. And so the revolution for me and its re repercussions throughout my life has been, I need the depth. I need the profound. I need the sublime. And I'm constantly drawn to it. And if there's something I try to do with my work, even if I'm doing a funny mimetic thing, is to still make sure the humanity, the depth, the meaning, and also the unquantifiable and the unknowable is still present in that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, are there any further questions that, um, for, for Marjan? Feel free also to join our conversation as well if you'd like. Yes, I was wondering, um, uh, Marjan, if, uh, well, because the social media plays such a, an important role now in, in the kind of promotion of an artwork, um, and you were talking just a few minutes ago about the flatness of uh, the meanings, I, uh, it, it didn't, are you not afraid that uh, first impression is candy for the eye and then the meaning get lost because we all scroll to the next uh, animation or on our screen. Uh, what what in your what in your um, sorry <laughs> what in your opinion uh, well makes difference uh, between you that people stop by and say there must be something different or, or everyone takes anyway something different from what you produce or, or an artwork. Um, but how do you think that you engage in, in a different manner with, uh, with your audience? You know, that's a very, very good question because that's changing the nature of art. I think that if you're doing a piece for a white cube gallery where there's a space and, and you can devote a lot of time and attention to it, you sort of craft that piece and you create that piece in a very different way. 
I think when you look at a lot of pieces that perform well in galleries and museums and you sort of transpose them into Instagram feed, they get lost. They get completely lost, like you said, because they were never really designed to perform for the attention economy. Uh, I mean, on the, on the one hand, the attention economy does promote the, the basis instincts of humans <laughs> in a way that, you know, is, is not so great. Uh, but I still feel as if the, 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 real, the, real, uh, the, the real gift of artists to each era is that they find ways of creating artwork with the schemas of their time, with whatever they're given or whatever they're handed. And that was, you know, uh, murals on a wall during the Renaissance, that's what they worked with. Then when the Venetians came up with canvas, that's what they worked with and so on and so forth. And I think in the 20th century with the advent of photography, film, video, et cetera, once again, art changed. So I think each generation has to sort of look to their time, to their moment to figure out what is the art of this moment. And so one of the things that I do is I'm aware of the attention economy and the eyeball economy as it's called on social media. So I am consciously uh, working with that setup. And um, so naturally I, I work with visual content that is compelling. Um, I think something that, that I think Gibson was, uh, was very prescient with uh, Neuromancer and, and that, the Neuromancer trilogy in general, but I think after Neuromancer, you know, he sort of came up in his other books with the concept of cool hunting. But I don't think he realized how appreciated that would be because cool hunting is what all of us are doing at any given time when we're looking through our social media feeds. I mean, we're all cool, hunter, cool hunters now. So that, that existing instinct of humans to find novelty and uh, the unusual uh, is now driving, some argue, the, the capitalist consumer, capitalist consumerism, which I also agree with. And to a large extent, it's also driving the eyeball economy of the internet. But I think artists that are doing and creating work for the net and to a large extent crypto art uh, have to understand that uh, visual ecosystem the same way a painter has to understand the white cube ecosystem of a gallery. So you have to sort of approach, uh, you know, the net and crypto art with some understanding of what works with this premise and deliver works for this premise. Yeah. And I just wanted to ask, finally, sort of what's next? You know, what, where do you see your interventions um, going from now forward? Well, I think, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I was just mentioning uh, before the talk that my last uh, art hack outside the shed where Freeze New York was held, uh, I was able to upload it to all social media, but not Facebook. No matter what I did, Facebook would not upload the video and I filed a report and they said it violated community standards. And I'm like, there's no nudity in it. There's no violence in it. I have no idea why this would violate community standards and then I realized it might be a copyright issue because of the shed even though I had shot the footage but you know I mean that's also made me realize that um, you know uh, there might if if this is a new type of uh, if this is a new type of censorship in terms of copyright enforcement it might seriously restrict my ability to continue to do art hacks into the future especially if they involve you know symbolic architecture or buildings or things of that kind so Right now, I think the art hack future is <laughs> up in the air, depending on what happens with the social media and how they want to enforce uh, mixed reality hacks um, and whether they allow it or not. But I think that for me um, right now, uh, I, I have a lot of inquiries from you know, people wanting to collect the art hacks. And so the challenge for me is how to create a copyright cleared version to uh, sell because I'm not, I mean, I know other crypto writers kind of don't do that, but I actually abide by copyright laws, generally speaking, when I sell work. I think I allow um, transgression and appropriation in my art when it's not for sale uh, with the art hacks. Uh, that's part of my dialogue. But I think if I'm going to create a version for sale, it has to be copyright cleared. So I, I, I'm looking at various different uh, innovative ways of uh, you know, redoing a hack in, the hacks in a way that retains the original hack but are also uh, copyright cleared. And I guess uh, the, 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 the next thing that I'm um, 
you know, the next thing that I would really like to do is to uh, advance my chromatic sculpture technique, you know, even further with some newer tools and newer technologies that I've been sort of testing with and uh, hoping to be able to uh, incorporate into my pipeline and, and do new animations with. So those are all the different directions I'm going in right now. Lots of crypto art. And of course, finishing uh, the commission for Hillsborough Park in the UK. And uh, just one other quick thing I wanted to mention is I'm working on a very interesting project, uh, which is uh, the story of my life, um, <laughs> commissioned by the Helium app. And it's an AR, uh, AR story, an AR poem uh, with the sort of profound take on it, if you may. Uh, so I'm very excited uh, by this project because the interactivity is going to be driven by biofeedback uh, mechanisms and breath cycles, brain waves, and other things. So. It's, it's, a, it's a really interesting way of working with XR and extending it into the biological function of a person and allowing them to interact with the components, with their breath, with their heartbeat, and also advance the story uh, with their brainwaves. So it's, it's a very exciting project and it's with the Story Us division of Helium Act. And I'm literally in the middle of it, just finished chapter three and on to chapter four <laughs> uh, this month. And will that be accessible just through the Hillsborough Trail? Or? No, that's the Helium app. Oh, sorry. Yeah, right. that'll, that'll be one of the stories that's available through the Helium app. So yeah. Helium app is, uh, you know, bunch of, is a group of different VR experiences and also AR experiences, all, all of which have a healing component. Um, story uh, Us was a division they created specifically for healing stories. And they wanted people with trauma to share their stories of how they transcend a trauma. So, <laughs> which is a very interesting concept. So it's not just every kind of a story, the idea is it's a healing story. How, how did I get through these difficult things in my life and what was my uh, take on it? So these are gonna be a combination of VR experiences and AR experiences. Uh, the one that I'm doing is an AR experience, which you can literally unfold sitting in a chair on your tabletop or unfold it life-size and wander through it. Sounds really, really interesting. Um, and I hope to see it sometime soon. How many more chapters do you have to do? Uh, it's about seven chapters. So there's four more. <laughs> it's, it's not, it's, it's, uh, I'm working with Alyssa Stahl. She's wonderful. She's the programmer and app builder. And um, so we, we, you know, I mean, I usually upload my Unity scenes to Alyssa and then Alyssa has to kind of make it work with all the biofeedback things. So you know, we go back and forth with each other. And, and uh, so, and, and things like this are always challenging because I'm delivering a lot of visual content. Um, and, you know, and I'm trying to create really interesting ways of interacting with all of these elements. And she has to get it all working on her end with the biofeedback. So it's, it's challenging. Projects like this are not very easy to do because everything is an unknown. <laughs> Everything we do is like has its own set of issues and problems. So they do take a little bit longer development wise. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Marjan, for being in conversation with us today. It's been really inspiring to learn more about your work and your future projects. Um, and I'm very excited at the prospect of those. Um, and thank you, everyone, for coming and joining us today. Thank you, indeed. Well, um, it was really a, a super good uh, a talk. Thank you so much, uh, Marianne. Um, I just uh, would like to remind everyone, if you can go on the top of uh, the chat box and please click on the, the Twitter link for Sotheby's and please nominate Marianne uh, and the piece Taking the Knee um, to be with the hashtag Natively Digital. And uh, please also, also tag Marianne. <laughs> and so we are really uh, looking forward to see uh, this exhibition in the central land soon. And June of course, uh, June exactly, June 1st. And of course, for us, the lucky Brits, we are going to visit you in the park. <laughs> awesome. Um, I look forward to seeing you and all of your avatars <laughs> in the central land. <laughs> in Central Land, yes, exactly. 
Perfect. Um, does anyone want to, would like to, to talk or join, uh, ask uh, 